This is the Chateau of Ferney, near the border between France and Switzerland, and close to Geneva. It's the place where Voltaire spent the last 20 years of his long life. It was the center of a large estate, and being Voltaire, it was not just a place to live, but the opportunity to put into practice many of his ideas about how people should live together. Voltaire set up a number of businesses so that the people round about could have work. Watchmaking was particularly successful and the manufacture of silk stockings. He experimented with new farming methods. He even rebuilt the church and dedicated it not to a saint, as was the usual practice, but to God. As a result, the people of Ferney don't forget him. At the same time, of course, he was writing his usual torrent of words on a whole variety of subjects. The evils of the church, politics, philosophy, and of course turning out creative work in the form of plays and novels in his own very distinctive style. He received a constant stream of visitors from all around the world, and he carried on a vast correspondence with a large number of very interesting people. His long life spanned the years of the 18th century, which we generally refer to as the Enlightenment, and he himself did quite a lot to enlighten the world and turn over a few stones to reveal the hypocrisy and corruption which he saw as bedeviling the world. His collected works run to over 40 volumes, his correspondence quite as many. As a writer, it is important to distinguish him from most others. He was also a man of action. He could not just write about things. He had to be doing. He was practical, energetic, and always ready to throw himself into the fray when action was called for. At the same time, he was contemplative and intellectual to the highest degree. Most unusually of all, he had a great sense of humour, with which he entertained his world and still entertains ours today. When Voltaire was born in Paris in 1694, the son of a successful lawyer, Arouet, his father's clients included a number of noblemen, and so courtiers of the great King Louis XIV, the Sun King as he was called, because everything in France turned around him. Louis XIV was undoubtedly one of the most remarkable men ever to rule, either in France or anywhere else. He was an intelligent and gifted dictator, and just what France needed at the time he became monarch. When he began, the country was ruled by a babel of gifted but self-serving nobles, who were Renaissance princes and conscious of their individuality, but who had no idea of the nation-state and what their responsibilities to it might be. In England, in the 17th century, when they had problems with the government and the king would not do what they wanted, they cut off the king's head and established the primacy of the bourgeois parliament. Of course, in England, they then brought the king's son back, in the form of Charles II, but with greatly reduced powers. Never again was England to be ruled by a despotic king. Parliament had the power. In France, however, they had Louis XIV. When he was finished, certainly the nobles were severely curbed and power was slipping away to the new merchants and bourgeoisie but the patterns of rule he had laid down were to wither for another 65 years or so before the French Revolution, when, like the English, the king was deposed and finally executed for misusing his power. At his palace of Versailles, at the time of Voltaire's birth, all the power was gathered into Louis's hands. Courtiers who wanted any influence had to stay at court and master the art of hiding their true feelings 
and always be ready with the right words of flattery. The people they had to flatter were most often the line of women who came to be the king's mistresses, women like Madame de Maintenon. It was all a question of influence and money. Talent might get you noticed, but you could as quickly rise as fall if you did not have the right backers. The gardens of Versailles underline one simple thing, however, form and order. Louis gave this to the French, you might say. Things had to be done the right way. Order was everything. This was a huge change from the disorder of previous reigns, and it set the stage for the Enlightenment in thought and style, which was to characterize the century of Voltaire. Voltaire was not slow to realize that favor at the court was the only way to advancement. And when people discovered what wit and charm the young man had, he was at first eagerly sought out. But of course, what he wanted was to be accepted on his merits as a writer, and he was not slow to present his wares. The king's death intervened. In 1715, Voltaire was 21. Louis XIV died and was succeeded by a young man, Louis XV, too young to rule. A regent, the Duc d'Orléans, took the reins and everyone thought they were at last free from the tyranny of Louis, including Voltaire, who was not slow to pen some scurrilous stuff about Louis's regime. It was too much for the Duke and Voltaire suddenly found himself in the notorious prison, the Bastille. Here he is, writing things in desperation on the wall. It was not as bad as this. He had good food and lots of company, including the governor, with whom he often dined. But a year in the Bastille was quite enough for him. He had to be more circumspect. So he wrote a play called Oedipe, based on the Greek tragedy about the incest of Oedipus. He owed a lot to Racine, certainly, but the play was a huge success. In it he managed to revile the church, the regent, the past regime, and the current one. The public loved it and flocked to the theatre, and of course the government hated him. This time he was sent into exile from Paris only, to the home of a friend, the Duc de Souilly. He thought he was safe there until some of his enemies in the government arranged for him to be beaten up and sent to the Bastille again. They let him out again a few days later, but for a witty and outspoken man, France was no longer safe. He went to England. He already had a good English friend in Lord Bolingbroke, who had married a Frenchwoman and lived for a time in France. Bolingbroke had much influence and Voltaire was well received. He met the literati, Congreve, a successful writer of comedies. He met Alexander Pope, a witty poet who didn't trust Voltaire for some reason. He met the Irish Dean of St. Patrick's, Swift, who had written Gulliver's Travels a wonderful satire on human morals, which Voltaire admired immensely. Voltaire began to arrange a translation into French. He read the works of Burke and Bishop Berkeley, philosophers of the Enlightenment, 
who were influencing the minds of Englishmen everywhere. He was astonished that they could write as they pleased. Tolerance of different views on morality and religion. What was the country coming to? No one threw them into the Tower of London. He was equally astonished to attend the funeral of Isaac Newton in Westminster Abbey in 1727. A scientist and valued by society. Who would come to the funeral of a scientist in France? Voltaire went constantly to the theatre. He lived for a time round the corner from Drury Lane Theatre, learned English well and found himself in much agreement with the ways of English society. Many of his reflections he wrote about in what were published as Lettres Philosophiques, sometimes called Letters from England. On his return to Paris, he found he had inherited some money from his father. Always aware of the power money confers, he invested it and spent much energy for the rest of his life nurturing his investments until he was a very rich man. Of course, he wrote more plays. Brutus was one, and the next, Zaire, both tragedies in the classic French form, which preserved the three unities of space, time and place, something which, in spite of his experience of the free-rolling English theatre, he could not break with. Again, he was a hit with the public. He wrote a successful history of the reign of Charles XII, but again, he went too far. Adrienne Lecouvreur was a famous actress he knew well and admired. However, when she died in 1731, the church refused her burial in consecrated ground because of her dubious profession. For Voltaire, this was utter humbug coming from people who had so much admired her work when she was alive. He wrote a bitter and much publicized attack on their treachery to her. He was so popular with the public that the authorities held their hand for a time. With the publication of his Lettres Philosophique, he finished himself. His views on the English Parliament, the Church, the theatre, they all clashed with the received views of the court, and he had to escape for safety to Lorraine then a separate little state on the eastern border of France. His Lettres Philosophiques were burned by the hangman in June 1734. Well, better the books than the writer was undoubtedly Voltaire's view. Falling in love was something Voltaire did quite often, but most significantly with the Marquise de Châtelet. He was 39, and she was 24 when they met, and finally moved to her chateau at cirey sur blaise close to the border with Lorraine, and sufficiently far from Paris and its dangerous and suspicious police forces. It was quite acceptable for such a liaison, as of course she had married her Marquis for money and status, and the Marquis was quite flattered that she'd taken up with so notable a man. He visited them at Cire and apparently got on well enough with Voltaire. Voltaire was attracted to the Marquise as a woman, of course. She was generally not reckoned beautiful by her woman friends, but maybe they were jealous. But she was a lot more than that. In her field of mathematics and science, she was the equal of many eminent men. Apparently, she liked books, diamonds, algebra, petticoats, and physics. And in her insatiable curiosity about everything, she matched Voltaire. Her conversational powers and intelligence meant that while they worked independently by day at their various intellectual labors, their evenings were spent in convivial conversation and mutual respect. It suited both of them down to the ground. Voltaire built this wing onto the chateau for his own use and generally improved the place. He had the money, so he put it to good use. The Marquis was grateful. 
Up in the huge attics, he built a little theatre, and as was his usual practice, when a new play was ready, he acted it out with the help of visiting friends, forcing everyone to learn their lines and directing them just as he'd done with the professional actors in Paris. It was a stable and fruitful period of his life. He stayed for almost 20 years until the Marquise became pregnant by another man. She was, of course, old for such an event and died in childbirth. He did not mind her infidelity. After all, he was an old man by this time, but he was devastated by her loss. It was the end of a truly romantic and fruitful relationship. For many years, Frederick II, King of Prussia, known as the Great, had been an admirer of Voltaire. He was an unusual king for his time, the nearest thing to a liberal despot, if that is possible. Of course, he had absolute powers, as did most of his fellow monarchs at the time, except the kings of England. In the 18th century, a king could call off with his head, and off it came. Not with Frederick. He stopped executing people altogether, a quite astonishing move for any king to make. He began erecting public buildings and improving roads to make things work more effectively. He introduced schemes of education for the common people. He developed manufacturing concerns, encouraged free trade, and in fact did a great deal to improve the lives of his people, and as a result, the prosperity of his small state. He also developed a first-class, well-disciplined army, already well established by his father. For many, it was a privilege to serve in Frederick's army. All this resulted in his becoming a great deal more powerful and influential than he would otherwise have been. Much of what he did that was liberal and enlightened emanated from the ideas of Voltaire. It was no surprise when, after the death of Madame de Châtelet, Voltaire decided to move to live in Frederick's enlightened capital of Potsdam. Voltaire was, of course, open to flattery, like many others, and the king's invitation was quite hard to refuse. He was under no illusions about Frederick, however, he was still an absolute monarch, and as such, not to be relied on. Still, Frederick did try. He was musical and played the flute reasonably well. He tried to get Voltaire to teach him to write poetry in French, in which he was fluent. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, of course, even if the sow happens to be a well-endowed king. So Frederick's literary progress stalled. Then there was the question of women. Women had always figured largely in Voltaire's life, but at Frederick's court, although he was officially married, they hardly existed. However, for a while, Voltaire, the most eminent ornament of the court, felt reasonably satisfied. Frederick was not backward when it came to spending money. He built this summer palace for himself first, sans souci, without care. There were figs and grapes under careful cultivation on the terraces. The splendid gardens were full of echoes of the order of classical Greece, much in fact for Voltaire to admire. Entertaining his guests to tea was easy when you had a tea house like this. From a design by Frederick himself, the tea house unsurpassingly captures the oriental taste, which was the order of the day in mid-18th century Europe. But as kings do, Frederick, once he'd achieved his goal of capturing Voltaire, got a bit tired of him, as Voltaire did of the king. Two events drove them apart. 
A scientist called Maupertuis, well known in Europe, had been the leading light in Berlin before Voltaire came. Maupertuis had some mad schemes about founding the perfect society in the bowels of the earth. Voltaire could not resist writing a comic poem about this. Called Diatribe of Dr. Akakia, it made merciless fun of Maupertuis, Frederick's favourite scientist. Voltaire himself read it to Frederick, who laughed his head off, but of course forbade publication. Voltaire agreed, but naturally he could hardly bury his funniest lines, so somehow the work got around and Frederick was suitably furious. Then the businessman Voltaire, unable to miss a good financial deal when he saw one, secretly speculated against the king's currency using inside information and connections and was found out. Well, the king was even more mad this time, and Voltaire a bit rueful at being discovered. So he left. Kings, no matter how clever, were not to be relied on. His next stop was Geneva, and in 1754, at the age of 60, he bought a house overlooking the city, which he renamed Les Delices now a library and base for the study of his works. He restored it and worked on the grounds. At first it seemed a good choice, but as usual he began putting on plays. His Zaire went down well with the local intelligentsia, but not with the local Calvinist priesthood. He wrote things about Calvin in the local paper. It was all happening again so he began to look around for somewhere he could really settle. He found Fernie not far off, and as we know, that was to be his final home. It was also to be his final, and perhaps most remarkable, phase as a writer and polemicist. One day, someone from Toulouse turned up at Fernie, seeking Voltaire's help for a Protestant family who had been tragically victimized by the Roman Catholic Church and the local council. Voltaire knew about the case, but it was only when faced with the real facts that he realized it was a prime example of the prejudice and hypocrisy by which the Catholic Church exerted its influence in France. He decided to take a hand. The eldest son in the family had committed suicide and his father known to dote fondly on his lost son and much respected in Toulouse, a largely Catholic town in Languedoc in southeastern France, was accused of murder, tortured and eventually died in prison. It was a hugely unjust affair and Voltaire fought the case for over three years. He pulled every string imaginable. He petitioned all his many friends at the French court. He even called in Frederick's help. He bribed information out of people and generally exposed the self-serving priesthood and the corrupt ways of the local town council. Eventually the Callas affair ended with a posthumous pardon for the old man Callas and remarkable support for the injured family. Voltaire's personal campaign to écraser l'infâme, which can be translated as wipe out corruption in high places, was brought perfectly into relief by this callous affair, and it helped to increase his reputation as one of the great liberal minds of the French Enlightenment. Staying with Voltaire at Ferney was his niece, Madame Denis and a Jesuit priest with whom he played chess. It's not hard to imagine the arguments they had. Visitors poured in from all over Europe, and his correspondence continued at a frenetic pace. One of the most prominent among these was the Empress Catherine of Russia, who was greatly interested in his ideas and who did her best to implement some of them in her court. She tended to look for merit rather than birth when she was choosing her advisers, 
and she rewarded them well and treated them well, winning from them good service and loyalty. Catherine admired him so much that she negotiated to buy his library when he finally left Fernie and housed it in a specially built building in the Hermitage, where it is today. At 65, Voltaire wrote Candide, a short novel about the absurdities of man's nature. It is the work by which he is best known today, something which would no doubt surprise him not a little. But it is charming and witty and a perfect example of his power to knock mankind on the head and reassure at the same time. If ever anyone understood that there are no hard and fast rules in life, that nothing is perfect, but that life is worth living for all that, it was Voltaire. Voltaire had spent his life more or less as an exile, but his reputation for standing up for integrity, for scorning humbug, for supporting people, no matter what their birth or station in life, had become legendary. So it was wonderful for him to be invited back to Paris in his last year of life. When he arrived, he announced to a friend that he had interrupted his death agony to come along and shake his hand. His last play, Irene, was put on at the Comédie Française. It was a tremendous success. He met the American, Benjamin Franklin, who had so much to do with setting up the new American state after the American Revolution. They got along famously. And then he died. Would the church allow the burial of so heretical a man in consecrated ground? Just in case it would not, his friends whisked his body away to a churchyard outside Paris, where it lay until the Revolution. In an extraordinary scene, it was brought back by the revolutionaries and reburied in the Pantheon, burial place of the Great of France. Voltaire might have liked the honour, but at the thought of the horrors of the revolution, he must have spun in his new grave. Without a doubt, Voltaire showed that the pen is indeed mightier than the sword. In his writing, he encapsulated the ideas of the 18th century Enlightenment in ways that are easily understood by the ordinary man. He encourages us above all to be absolutely clear in our ideas and our expression of them. But most of all, perhaps, we remember Voltaire because it is so reassuring to know that there has been someone in our world who was not afraid to debunk the foolish fads and fancies of humanity or to unmask the dreary people who try to assume authority over us and tell us what we should think or not think. That's his greatest legacy. The great sculptor Houdin captured him perfectly in that smile, both scornful and benevolent at the same time. It is not easily forgotten. As Voltaire lived a long time and was fantastically industrious, this might be an enormous task. However, he is now known by only a few works and even fewer of these are found in translation. We will deal with those only. They fall into four groups. Plays, mostly written in verse, history, philosophy, and novels. There exist around 8,000 of his delightful letters. <laughs> 
plays. He wrote around 50 full-length plays, most of them tragedies, the first when he was 18 and the last when he was 80. He was certainly considered by his peers as the dramatist of the age and quite the superior of Shakespeare. If translations can be found, then half a dozen or so might be worth reading. They are rarely staged because they are not at all our kind of theatre. The titles, Edup, Brutus, La Mort de César and Tancred, suggest their classical subjects. Others, Zaire, Mohammed, L'Orphelin de la Chine, the orphan of China, suggest the taste of the times for things oriental. But they were extraordinarily successful with his audiences and the actors and the theatre managers because they could all be read as commentaries on the times. He nursed them, rewrote them, carefully watched the reactions to them in the theatre and made sure all his effects worked to the full. And of course, more often than not, he was a wanted man because the authorities could not stomach his work. History. Voltaire was a serious scholar and his approach to writing history was in his age new and the beginnings of enlightened history writing which continues today. His most important works are a history of the time of the French kings Charles XII, Louis XIV and Louis XV. He wrote also a history of the empire of Russia under Peter the Great. He collected evidence of every sort to make his work as accurate as possible. His writing ranged over a wide range of human activity as he did not feel history was just political events. And although recent research has opened up information he did not have access to, his judgments and approach remain sound. Philosophy. Voltaire wrote many pieces on philosophy, but his thinking is best encapsulated in a work known as Lettres Philosophiques, or sometimes Letters from England, as he wrote them while he was in exile in England for three years. They are inspired by the differences he found between English and French life, particularly the freedoms enjoyed by the English in thought and expression. They cover many aspects of social life in a haphazard way, and many are concerned, not surprisingly, with literature. But they are approachable and delightful to read, even if he spends a lot of energy shafting the aspects of the French system, particularly religion, which he despises. Voltaire was a true European, in that he saw the human race as having more in common than the nationalist blindness of his time would allow. Needless to say, he learned to speak English perfectly. Novels. He wrote about 25 short novels. His writing is satirical, of course. He's making fun of the foibles of the human race. But to take his most popular work today, he'd probably be astonished at this, Candide, he satirizes with a warmth and a humanity, an amused tolerance, perhaps, which makes his work marvellous to read. Voltaire was no saint himself, and he did not lack self-knowledge, so the failures of his heroes and heroines are dealt with so amusingly and sympathetically that we are with them to the end. Others worth reading are Zadig, Memnon, the vision of Babuk and Bababek. This last one is about fakirs, or people that Voltaire chose to call fakirs, people who try to impress others with their uniqueness. The writing of all these is imaginative, subtle and at times touching, and of course often uproariously funny. We are supposed to have progressed in openness and honesty since the time of Voltaire, but there is little here that is really so strange to us. The essence of Voltaire Read Candide and the Lettre Philosophique.